Welcome everybody to uh, this little bootcamp on the, we call it using the future, but this one is about futures driven innovation. I'm joined here by my colleague, uh, Louisa, who is going to be support for, for today's activities. And hopefully we're going to have a lot of fun and, and get to explore what, what is future driven, futures driven innovation and what does it mean for you and how can you use it in day life? Of course, this is not, uh, we're not going to go through a whole process in two hours, but we're going to take us as, as far as we can, right? So we're going to do a lot of interactive exercises. I hope you're ready to do that and not just listening in um, to actually get a hands-on perspective on how you use the future in terms of generating innovative ideas and the other way around. Uh, I, I see some names I, I recognize and a lot of new people. So I hope uh, you're all familiar with the SIFs in some way. You know, you're all supposed to be members and partners. And I think that's what we have led in here. Um, we're really excited. Uh, let's get started and no more talking for me, uh, at least uh, about that for now. So why are we uh, gathered here today? Um, there are two primary reasons why we think future innovation is, is critical to operating any organization. So one is that you know the present moment is not it used to be the unimaginable future. Some of you might have seen this before if you attended our courses, just to say that the future the, is, is not predictable. You know, it's not going to be the same as today. So we need to move past present oriented innovation um, techniques, at least as a, as a sole uh, part of, of the method. Then it's also to make the future more tangible and actionable. We need to use the future. That's why then we have the name of the bootcamp um, to actually make something out of it. We need to change our ways, make better decisions and so on. So that's, we're trying to give you kind of a, a compass to work with here today that you can make sure you're able to use the future and hopefully in your organization or in your context. So today we're gonna give you a, a few uh, lessons on one on innovation and, and future innovation. So we're gonna try to hopefully elevate your innovation toolbox a bit and use it to some new methods and so on. Of course, it's not gonna be extensive. We're not gonna cover everything related to foresight, futures, innovation, and so on, but we're gonna go a, a long way, right? We're gonna try to help you build, build the futures mindset. That's something we always focus on, something that becomes more critical in this day and age, and, and especially moving on, that we are open to change and embracing whatever uncertainty that out there. Um, we need to understand because for some people might see think uh, innovation and, and foresight is that the same or, or is it not? But we, we see the two different things. Of course, innovation involves the idea of of implementing new ideas, existing ideas, or new ideas in a different context or in a different setting, trying to make something valuable for customers, or, or clients, and partners, and so on. Uh, so we're going to try to using the future for innovation. Um, and then creating some ideas, being a bit creative today. Be, I hope you're open and ready to, to work with whatever we have here. Uh, it's going to be hopefully a, a fun session, so um, stay tuned. The agenda, I'm not going to go too much into detail. I'm not going to talk too much either. Yeah, hopefully you won't think so. We're just going to have a few short uh, introductions into what is foresight the future studies uh, for those who are of futures thinking, for those who are not familiar with the concepts. I'm going to do some exercises catch up a bit in plenary, what did you think about exploring the future and identifying what's most critical? Then we're gonna move into actual future driven innovation and see if we can generate some cool concepts. Our case today is gonna to be about the future of work, which is something I hope you all have some familiarity with. That's at least the intention for choosing, choosing this of a broad topic. So in the end, we're gonna have some cool innovation concepts and hopefully you can, you can pitch them in the end. We have a bit of time to wrap up and. And, and answer questions and so on. Great. All right. So you're all here today because I hope you want to learn something. I also want to learn something working with you. So it goes both ways. Uh, we have this quote that we love to use about how in times of change, which we're in right now, the learners will inherit the world while the knowers will be beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. So we don't try to be knowers. We don't need to know it all. And we need to embrace that there is some uncertainty and instead be open-minded, ready to learn, and so on. Also, in terms of rules of engagement, uh, we would like for you to be active in this workshop in the group. So please put on your camera when you work in the group work and, and so on, and don't try to disturb the, the rest of the group. And I think we're gonna have a fun time together. Maybe you'll meet some new cool people as well. So that's a, a side effect. 
So this is uh, more or less our conceptual way of, of doing future stream innovation, at least one of them. Uh, what we try to do first in every single process we, we deal with is try to explore the future. Uh, it can be scanning, we can look at signals, drivers, blockers, create scenarios and so on. Um, that's usually a bigger part of when we do uh, our Copenhagen method, uh, which is more focused on creating a strategy as unique initiatives in the end. Then what we have focusing on future stream innovation is one of the most critical issues, what are the most critical change dynamics that are, is around us today. Um, so actually seeing it, not just looking at, you know, what are the latest trends, but also what are the barriers to change? What are some of the signals out there that we're not really grasping yet that might offer some, some space for innovation uh, eventually? Then we look to identify what are the opportunities out there? What are the, what are the problems we have? What are the problems our stakeholders, our clients, and so on have? Uh, and based on those key uh, problems, we identify key pains and gains um, we try to create and test out solutions, right? We try to, to create prototypes or ideas. Today, we're going to ideate uh, a bit. We're not going to develop physical prototypes. Um, but that's, a, that's at least a, an option and a pathway you can go for. And then, of course, in, a, in an innovation process, it's, um, it's important that you don't just leave it there, that you actually plan ahead. What are we actually going to do with this concept, these ideas? Again, testing, iterating, and so on, making it ready for the market or the internal organization or so on. Great. Um, so um, in terms of futures thinking, uh, some of you might have heard about the butterfly effect, you know, uh, how, how it kind of the small changes in the, the waving of a butterfly with, the, with its wings can make big changes in the end. Um, and that's what we hear of course also today, you know, sometimes the future is not predictable. We can't, um, can't just say, okay, 10 years from now, we'll be there and there and we will do this and this. Uh, we need to be open to uncertainty or an open to the small changes that's taken place that might lead to a bigger change down the line. So that's what futures thinking is about. Try to embrace change, how to be open-minded, looking from the future into the present, not the other way, other way around. Try to put ourselves in a different mind space and see if we can reframe some of our assumptions and ideas about how the future could look. Um, so right now, just to get you started thinking, and I, I don't need an answer, but I want you to just take one minute to silently reflect, well, how do you react to change? So for example, when a large thing happened at work or in your life and so on, how do you respond to change? Um, what is the last time something happened? What, how, how did you do it and has it changed over time? So just take uh, one minute. So some people have a more, have a very, um, have a mindset with very much agency. You, know, you can change the way uh, the world looks. You can change the way around you. Sometimes something is out of your control. So you try to focus on it, what's inside your control. And that's, we're, we're trying both today, trying to be open to what we can't control and try to look at it with an open mind. And then also try to see what can we actually make today that can might fit into the, the future down the line. So in terms of futures thinking, so why should we study the future? So why, why does uh, the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies exist? Um, we see the future as a multiple. They're not, we don't see it as a linear curve. So we're just moving from the present to the future and there's a straight line. Um, we see it as a, a path, like different pathways, potential pathways, depending on what we do today and tomorrow and so on. We want to use it to challenge mental models and try to refresh our assumptions about the future that might be a bit stale or obsolete. Uh, try to overcome thinking in short term all the time, operations, operations uh, next week and so on. Yeah. As I said, we want to learn about the present through the lens of the future. So we try to put ourselves in the future and think about the present. And then we also, it's for a, also for thinking across uh, industry spectrums and so on, then futures become very helpful uh, because a lot of changes are happening all the time in our environment. And sometimes the biggest changes might come from outside what you expect. And that's why we need to think in the larger systems that we're seeing in society and not just isolated and focusing on a narrow path. Um, also, I guess uh, you kind of deserve to know who I am if you haven't uh, met me yet. Um, I'm the head of memberships and partnerships at uh, SIFS. I'm, my name is Matthias Bernhoff. Um, and I, I, I came, come from a background in innovation entrepreneurship. 
and have been kind of using it in my work here at CIFS, trying to to bridge the, the gap that I saw in, in kind of between innovation and, and futures in some ways. Uh, so what definitions are we using for different things? Right? There, you already heard a lot of concepts. It might be a bit confusing already, but so strategic foresight is what we do a lot as SIFS. We try to plan for the future based on different kind of mindsets, methodologies, um, and the many factors that shape the world. Futures thinking is more about the mindsets, the cognitive processes, the, the biases we have trying to put ourselves in a different state of mind. Innovation is about you know, finding and bringing new ideas to life. Uh, it might not be radical, all of it, but uh, sometimes it is. And, and that's what we are also hoping to do, eventually create some positive change down the line. And that, what it says, radical innovation, trying to actually completely shift the, the the discussion, you know, was also called dis disruption, disrupting the, the status quo, completely changing the way society works. You've seen that a number of times. It's very difficult to, to create, but it's, of course, very effective when it works. Um, and we need to, to kind of aim for sometimes also creating disruptive and not just uh, incremental change in our societies, because otherwise we'll just slowly, slowly optimize, optimize, optimize. And, and never maybe shift to a whole smarter way of living or working and so on. So in terms of futures, uh, we used to use this futures cone where we look into different alternative futures. We have the possible, what might happen. We have the plausible, what could happen, what's more plausible in the sense of the word. And then we have the probable, what's likely to happen. Um, the trends we're seeing around us in society, the straight line that we're talking about. My colleague, uh, Simon Ustakol, he, uh, he talked, we, we had a discussion a couple of days ago around, is the probable future actually the least probable? Because that's the one where everything remains the same. And I think that's a very interesting thing to play around with because we all, all expect certain things to happen, but the more we expect them to happen, the more we lock ourselves in, in a state of mind and then we don't become prepared for what's outside. And of course, then we have the preferable future, whatever we, assigning our own value judgment would like to happen. Uh, we focus in this uh, setting very much on both the possible and the plausible, try to be think a bit outside the box and, you know, who might, as, as I said at first, the, the present used to be an unimaginable future. So what, what the future might be might be unimaginable now, but we, try, we can try already uh, our hands with it. And for example, this shows that it's not just, we're not just looking at technology or, you know, uh, some of the classic things that you might think, oh yeah, we're gonna be at one with robots and so on. Uh, knowledge and behavior change over time as well, very important, social change. So it's not really something to, to strive for anymore that you can supply enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. But at some point it was, and at some point it was something people were proud of. Um, so it's just to say that we we move along and with our, our social circumstances change as long with, with our societies, right? To become a better futures thinker, or at least open up, there's a, some things you can, there's a checklist or some things you can work on, at least try to seek diversity of opinion, try to look for what's out there, but not really mainstream yet. Try to acknowledge that you have some biases. Everyone has, I have as well. Try to reframe problems, not just think in, in the same old problems and the same old solutions, but try to reframe it and many other things, embrace uncertainty and so on. Um, the many things you can do to become more prepared for what's about to come, right? So it's also about something we think about a lot, is when does the future start? You might think, for me, the future starts tomorrow and that's, that is the future, but when we try to work with the future, it becomes more relevant to have some, some more mental flexibility in terms of thinking, you know, 10 years ahead means that we can put ourselves out of the status quo and the next, two to three years, the strategy um, the circles and, and try to think a bit longer, be a bit more productive. You can also think to the year 2100 and that can really be challenging and might be impossible to think about it. Imagine if you're back in a hundred years ago and try to think hundred years ahead, that is a very challenging proposition, but it's also something that can really get your creative juices flowing and say, oh, what if we live in a society in 2100 where uh, it's all utilitarian or climate change, climate crisis has been solved and we don't have countries anymore, whatever. They can be provocative in a new way. Um, so that's something to consider when you when you work with the future. Um, 
And again, I've been mentioning uncertainty some, sometimes now already. We try to, to see it as something we can embrace and something we use actively. Say, okay, we actually aware that there are some things that are uncertain. How can we navigate knowing that? How can we prepare for multiple different outcomes, different worlds we could live in? And that requires just this creativity that we need to let go of certainty. So um, it's a very, <laughs> very difficult proposition. You like to, the human mind likes to know that some things are certain, some things are going to be the same always, but that's rarely the case. Um, and of course, we need to be able to, to understand and, and be brave enough to, to look into a world that's, that's actually uncertain. Um, and you know, it, that's also why we're here with a big group. Uh, we try to uh, put people together and hopefully create some kind of sort of friction. So people meeting each other from different perspectives, diverse set of minds, different uh, geographical spaces, different genders and so on. Try to create some, some friction in the process to actually move on past the established norm, past the normal the assumptions we all think we have. So, so future-driven innovation, in many ways, um, is about exploring, understanding the, the future, and the friction, the opportunities that are lying outside, lying ahead of ahead of us. Um, because intentionally, we don't want to solve the problems of tomorrow with today's solutions. That's not what we try to do. Um, so again, many innovation techniques and so on focus on you know user needs right now and people what they, what did they want. Well, people always, don't always know what they want. That's one of the issues of focusing too much on the present and focusing too much on what people say they want, right? So we need to broaden our minds and work with different frameworks, test things out, iterate and so on. Key, key concepts of innovation, right? We need to apply what we call a future back mindset. And I think it's uh, from a book called Lead from the Future. Um, so it's about kind of, you know, not just extending building in front of us, keeping the future the same, but actually try to look from the future and back and creating more radical innovations in that sense. Great. So the case for today, um, all of you at some point, I assume, has thought about the future of work, especially with the COVID <laughs> being a very big disruptor to how we thought work was, work life was, at least in some industries, some cases, things don't look the same as they did before. Um, we talked about a new normal, but what is normal already maybe yeah, um, so I've, we have chosen this case purposely to have something that you all have in common, hopefully in, in some way you all have tried to work or are working. So it's a very broad theme, but it's still, we try to, to focus on something, right? Um, so some of the key questions we're gonna look at today, like how is technology gonna continue to transform the workforce, the way we work, the way we live and so on. And what are critical skills to have in the future also both for both for employees, but also for employers, leaders, um, and so on. And what are the impact of demographic shifts? So we have seeing aging populations, changing migration patterns, um, maybe more inter inter intergenerational, different generations working in the same place, maybe experience some issues. So there are a lot of things that you can consider here. And it's not just about you know, AI and technology, even though that's super interesting and that's relevant for sure. You can go into different areas right so now we're going to try to explore the future we're going to put you in different groups um, and then we're going to let you work a bit um, hopefully the, we have created a mirror board hopefully it's very intuitive i, uh, I think louisa will share the link in, in a moment uh, with you guys i'm just going to present the exercises we're going to take you through um, but in general exploring the future can be done in many ways we can look at change dynamics drivers enablers what is driving change? What is blocking change? With the future wheel, what are the implications of certain trends or events? We can look at the future triangle. What are the push from the present? What is kind of pushing change? What is uh, out there in the future pulling us towards a certain future? And what is weighing us down or kind of holding us to the way things are? So we have causal layered analysis. That's more about uncovering assumptions and biases deep within us and organizations. Um, we have horizon scanning, you know, looking to the horizon to see what are the things happening out there. We have environmental scanning, trying to look in the present day, what are the things happening right now? We can do scenario planning, building future scenarios. Um, that's something we do a lot here at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. And then there's also the more speculative approaches where you can set yourself 
free from kind of what we deem is a plausible possible future and be more challenging and say, what if this happened, then this might happen or challenging what's actually uh, possible. So we have some exercise today. I would say, you know, I've heard from my colleagues a bit a few times, you know, we've just been discussing this, the less is more. We, there might, might, you might be busy throughout these exercises, but I hope you will find it fun. It's more of a sprint than it's actually you know, like a thorough, a full-on process. So I hope you'll enjoy it and, and really learn something from it, um, even though it's going to be a bit fast. So before we start in your groups, so you're going to be dividing groups in a moment, going to have uh, elevator pitch introductions, just introduce yourself. You know, it's a great to start group work without saying, hey, I'm, my name is Matthias, like I just did uh, today, but, <laughs> but you have 30 seconds to share each of you what is, what is your role, what do you do for a living, and what's your biggest passion? It doesn't have to be in work relation. Great. Then we do a future storm, and it's kind of a framework adapted from the futures triangle, if some of you are familiar with that one. So first, we have a silent brainstorm in each group. And each person individually reflects what are the change dynamics for the future of work towards 2035. Um, and we divided it in what are the legacies and barriers to change? What are the trends and drivers pushing uh, change on? And what are the signals, the novelties, the niches out there? What are the things that we are seeing around us, but not really mainstream yet? So it's an open, it's a, it's a silent brainstorm and try to think in these, these terms, right? What you then have to do after you've done the silent brainstorm, so everyone gets a chance to think, everyone gets a chance to reflect, you should map the change dynamics. So you have these, so a change dynamic is a trend or an issue or something like that kind of a, in all of a mix, what, what is actually driving change, pushing change, you know, making society look different than what it is uh, right now. Or maybe something that's actually not gonna, like that's looking the same because we can't change it. So that's also something we have to consider. Um, some of these, you know, uh, legacy infrastructures you know, that, that, that have this happening. So introduce yourself, a silent brainstorm, think about uh, change dynamics. Then you should map it. There's a map uh, in the mirror board and the instructions are also in there if you need them. And finally, what you should do is identify opportunity areas. So we have, we'll have a map and then you should use the things that you identified as important in the, the form exercise to identify one opportunity area. So when opportunity area is an area of your, kind of your market organization, your client needs, where you want to aim your organization. And I know, realize you come from different places, try to think of a, a broader opportunity area, a space where there's room for innovation in such a way, right? It could be a space with visible friction. So some forces working against each other, some, something from the present pushing against uh, potential futures out there. It could also be just, there's an opportunity area. We see something happening, taking off with rapid speed, uh, change dynamic, you know, a trend or so on. Is there any opportunity area out there in 2035 that is underdeveloped that we need to focus on? So that's what an opportunity area is. It could also be a problem that you're trying to solve. Um, now you have uh, explored the future and you have kind of chosen what is the most important thing. So we already in the, in the future storm, you already kind of dealt with impact and what's the biggest impact on the future work and so on. And we also identify what is an opportunity area that we see here. What's the, where the frictions, any opportunities here that we would like to work with and explore further and try to develop uh, innovation concepts around. So now we're gonna bridge the gap between the future and, and innovation in that sense. All right, so I like this quote from uh, Matt Ridley. Uh, he's, an, he's an author, he's done, wrote and written several books. So innovation happens when people are free to think, experiment and speculate. So it, it's all a big experimentation uh, experiment in that sense. We are trying to, to play a bit and try to see around what, what are lying out there. And that's what the future is great for. So we can imagine what could happen and not just be limited by the like, boundaries of our present in that sense. So some things to consider when you're doing future story innovation. I just turning on old buttons, kind of, you know, uh, twisting and optimizing a bit. And that's completely fine. You need to do that as well keep uh, improving, right? Or do you manage to actually think out of the box, the very uh, tried and tested uh, wording of trying to think outside of the box, doing radical innovation. 
Um, I think what the future can help you do is help you to do is try to say, okay, let's speculate. What if this happened? Then we can actually create something completely new, free from from what we have today. And I I kind of locked in by some some assumptions you have, or like Adam, you think, oh yeah, maybe actually we need to um, revisit those and revisit the way we work. There are some mechanisms, some cultures, habits. We need to free ourselves a bit from those. That's why we need to move into the future in that sense. And of course, exploring the future, as I said, can take many forms and shapes. And this was a very quick and dirty way to kind of get your, your thinking going on what the future could look like. But it could be way more extensive. We can make scenarios. We can make, um, you know, and to write on to find uncertainties uh, out there in the future. So... This is a, as I already have done, uh, we have a few, maybe it's a bit unjust. Uh, so we want to combine, you know, exploring the future with the knowledge and experience we have today, not only investigating the, the recent past and, and the present, but actually focusing on, on the future as well, exploring that. So innovation is a, is a function. There are many different definitions of innovation, um, but it basically it's in, in a way it's a function of thinking, you know, intellectual abilities, knowledge, we need to know some things to kind of innovate better. Maybe we know something from a different industry that can be applied in your in your industry. And maybe you can find new ways of matching things, right? You need to have, be creative, you need to you know, think outside of the box and kind of maybe you can step outside your own environment for a while, uh, try something new, you know, get some new impressions, new inspiration. And as I said, we can base it on many different things, you know, the future should we expect to happen or the customer needs we we think before see in the future and so on. Technological mentors, what is the potential of AI and how can it uh, completely shatter uh, how we work uh, or change it, or maybe it doesn't, you know, looking into those kind of questions. So uh, I like this uh, little like, cartoon here. Uh, your proposal is innovative. Unfortunately, we won't be able to use it because we never tried something like that before. I think that's very telling about how things work uh, outside. Also, when we approach people and talk about the future, uh, you know, yeah, it sounds very interesting and it's probably you're thinking in new ways, but we haven't really done it before. So we don't know if there's any benefit to it. So it's become disregarded in that sense. Uh, so there are many ways, different ways of finding innovation opportunities that the unexpected, something that might happen to you, you know, looking at needs of existing needs, but also what can we see in the future? Might, might we need some talent? What can we do to kind of uh, make ourselves more appealing for that talent, you know? Demographics, as we mentioned, changes in behavior, which is very difficult to predict or at least, you know, expect to predict. But there are some things we can see, some some certainties in some of our ways of dealing as human beings that, that are kind of similar. And of course, breakthrough, you know, uh, scan the environment, see what's out there. Uh, sometimes it's there's something completely new. You know, many people were already kind of caught up with you know AI and, and chatbots and so on, but it still has surprised a lot of experts what the impact has left. And you know now we're kind of at the at the peak of the hype curve maybe and looking to see where we're, we will take it from here. So there are many different contexts for innovation as well. It's not just about a product or service. You know we can do process innovation, social innovation, uh, business model innovation. We can make a whole, whole business different than what it was started to be out to be, right? Um, so there are many different contexts of, of applying innovation in. Um, some a classic framework within design thinking is kind of the the Osterwald, the, um, the business model generation. You're looking for pains and gains and so on. And I think it's it's still very valid and it's something you can also explore in a future context. What are the future pains or problems that our stakeholders or clients have? What are the future uh, kind of you know jobs that they need to do in a different reality what they need to solve or or how can we make them make their lives or their circumstances even better right so what we're trying to do is kind of fit uh, the problem with a solution so we try to identify and that's what you're going to do as well um in this opportunity area that we kind of identified we need to find out what are the stakeholder so we need to identify a stakeholder right what are their jobs what do they need to do uh, what are the pains and what are the, is the they're struggling with, you know, the problems they have, and what are the gains, what are the things that can enhance uh, the situation? Um, so that's something we need to identify now. It, and remember to base it off what you've already done, the exercise you've already done, all the dynamics you've seen. We're not 
I mean, I stuck here in 2023. We're looking into the future and, and seeing what could happen, what could be the potential future uh, paints, games, and jobs, right? Um, so what is value? So innovation is about creating value and then value is a very, you know, uh, it's used in many different ways, but basically about, you know, making your stakeholder or your target doing something better uh, in different ways, you know, improving the circumstances, like improving a, a problem that's been hassling them. So a lot of people think, you know, yeah, let's give a product and then see how to use it. But we actually want a solution rather than a product or a service necessarily. What, what is it about what you have uh, proposing that will help their lives improve? Or it's a very big word. It could also be a small thing, right? But it's about looking for the needs, not the uh, tools for the needs, right? So for those of you who are not familiar, this is, again, the, the framework we're looking for for uh, gains, what are the outcomes you want? Does your stakeholder, so stakeholder can be many things again, want to achieve or what are the benefits they're seeking uh, considering this future, these futures that we're investigating? Uh, what are they trying to get done? What are the unmet needs? What are the things that they actually need to do in this, these futures? And what are the problems, the obstacles they're facing, right? Um, right. And something that's very, uh, true winning and a real paradox innovation that people you know they're in the first phase that we just came with uh or started and you know we explored the future it's very it's easier to be outside the box you know but now when we want to we want to generate ideas and so on based on the opportunities there is also important that we try to steer clear of the of the classic examples and of course it's, we have limited time but just try to say well how can i challenge it one step further what are the second order effects, the third order effects of what I'm uh, seeing here. Um, not just picking the, the business as usual uh, classic idea, but maybe you try to provoke yourself and like provoke each other a bit in the group discussions. So to do this, we have we think it's, it's quite necessary. We know you're coming from different organizations, very, very different organizations. So what we need to do is make a very, very simple archetype of an organization that you're in each group that you're working with. So you have to identify which type of organization are you, where you're operating in, um, what region, and so on. There's an ad lib, so like a, a framework in the mirror board as well to work. So just take five minutes, very like short. It doesn't have to be very, you don't have to write a whole story about the company history and so on. Just very simple and uh, basics. That makes it easier for them identify a primary stakeholder. So let's say you're, you're a, a bank and what you want to do is you want to innovate for your employees then that's your primary stakeholder in this opportunity area that you've chosen. Uh, I've, there are some examples in there also, as well with the, as you saw with the opportunity areas, it could be that you identify their, their intergenerational conflicts and their AI coming with full steam, right? So that's kind of the area that we're facing. And so we need to develop um, some kind of communication system to bridge these new people and new and machines in the communicating in the workplace, which can be a big struggle, right? That's an example of how an opportunity area could be. And then, you know, with this, we just take it on to your organization that you create and see, okay, how can we actually do something from our perspective, right? So what you need to do with the stakeholder you have identified, you need to find out what do they need to accomplish in this future based on the change dynamics, what can enhance the situation and what can, what are the problems they would like to have solved? Um, that's uh, we have ten minutes to that. So again, it's, it's quick and quick and dirty, and we're trying to get through some different tools and, and so on to to get you to see how it works in, in reality. Of course, it will be longer, right? And then after that, after we identify, and again, there are descriptions in the mirror board. We need to ideate, right? We need to come up with ideas, and it's good to be crazy and try to think outside the box. How can we do things in a different way? Again, looking at what we already explored. Is anything here that you know just fits in some ways, right? Uh, so try to build each other's ideas and try to come up with a lot of different ones, right? Uh, the more the better. Don't don't think too long about each idea. Just put them out there, right? So that's the ideas are based on everything you've done so far: the future storm, the opportunity areas identified, and the pains, gains, and jobs of the stakeholder. And finally, and I know there's there's a lot of exercises here. Uh, what we need, I I have, we have decided to. Um, to prioritize rigor or uh, you know, um, doing very few things and then not doing a, 
everything that we think is necessary in a, in a future innovation project process. So finally, we need to develop one innovation concept. So that's an idea that's turning into more than an idea, you know, a, a whole concept. So you have all generated some crazy ideas, hopefully. And then you have, each of you have two votes for ideas you prefer, and then your consensus agrees on what innovation concept canvas you should create. So we need to see, and in the, in the canvas, we need to see what is the concept called, what is, who's the target stakeholders, uh, what's the idea about, and so on, the value proposition, what is actually, how does the concept or the innovation actually help the stakeholder in the end? I would like to hear if any of the groups would like to pitch their, uh, their innovation concept just very quickly. Just 30 seconds, one minute. I think there's some great ideas up there. Yeah, we came up with a, an island, a concept called Imagined Island, where basically in the era of remote work and um, different standards for legislations across the world, this island was just in the cloud. Uh, and it's basically a company that can hire nomadic workers um, across all jurisdictions. And then the taxes will be paid out to all governments. That's great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That's, yeah. I think that's a ra radical idea for sure. And, and definitely tapping into some of the ch changes we're seeing around with more, more hybrid work and, and, and nomads. So thank you so much for, for sharing. All right, let me just uh, to round this thing off. Uh, I, I am impressed by how much you did in such a little time, but uh, you know that's that's what talented people do. So something you know it, you're not done when you do an innovation concept, right? Uh, in in theory of of doing the future stimulation process, uh, but you have made something that's actually that could be an idea that could work and become an actual service of product down the line. Right? So we need to, of course, when you do future stimulation, need to also test and mature an idea over time. Uh, we don't have time to go full in on testing and everything, but I, I want to show you a few frameworks of how that could be done. And I'll, of course, share the slides with you afterwards so you can check out more. A way to do it is to, um, I've just made these uh, scenarios in ChatGPT in, it took me maybe two minutes and I also have some descriptions and so on. Uh, I'll share those as well in the slide deck. Uh, basically, what you can do is that you can test up your, you can make scenarios. Uh, through whichever process, maybe the one we use at SIPS or another one. And then you can test your innovation ideas against different uh, scenarios and see, okay, does it, does it make sense in all the different alternative worlds that we're creating? Does it make sense to make a, this kind of island, for example, or, or is there any of the scenarios where we need to adjust the idea a bit? Then there's the how, now, wow matrix. I love the, the name of it, but basically that's to see in terms of how, what can we do already? What is easy to implement? Uh, what's impactful and so on, an assessment of that. What are actually the innovative breakthrough ideas that are easy to implement, uh, a way of prioritizing uh, ideas and concepts. And there's also a way of bringing it to life, creating user stories or future user stories. So what is the day in the life of a user in your scenario or a, the stakeholder you chose? I saw someone chose a CEO, someone else chose a HR department. So, so trying to bring it to life and kind of make sense of what is going on. Interviewing people, of course, in the present, also as a complement to whatever future scenarios or future changes that might happen. And then finally, of course, it's not super relevant for you because I don't know how many of you work with the future of work in your daily life, but it's just to say that to make it, we need to make it, make it stick. So innovation um, process is only as good as what we get out of it, right? We, we can get a lot of ideas, inspiration, so on, but it would be great if we can turn it into action. So always a way of doing it is we use this strategic choice cascade quite a lot for strategy. It can also be used for, for innovation concepts. So identifying exactly what is needed to make it come alive. What are the things we need to do? What are the things we need to focus on? Assigning responsibilities, of course, investing time. And, and there's a whole aspect of, you know, culture, eat strategy for breakfast. So making the idea stick in the organization. And that's, of course, a, a challenging effort. Yeah. But at least there are some of the way, right? Um, that was uh, more or less it. I hope you you had a lot of fun, even though I, I'm gonna stay and stick around for uh, q and I realize in the interest of time, we don't have uh, too much time to go into detail, but anything else, and you can send me an email uh, anytime. Um, I'll also share that in the in the uh, email afterwards with the slide deck and the link to the mirror board and so on, uh, the recording as well. Um, so you can check out the website for more. Uh, I know, we have some future seminars that are interesting. We'll do this again in the fall. 
with different uh, um, toolbox. So if you if you have some ideas and feedback, if you want anything different, this was the first time. Is there anything you want different? Maybe a few exercises that could be an option. Or if you want to focus on a specific uh, toolbox, let us know. We're open to it. You're our members and partners, so we appreciate you very much and your ideas. Um, great. Just in a few examples of what we have done, we have been looking into what it means to be ambidextrous in innovation, doing both radical and incremental innovation. We try to make an innovation blueprint for the future retail uh, for in, in, in IKEA centers, making scenarios and see how we can future inform that and trying to find new pathways using make it trends and new opportunities in that sense. So that's some of the cases. All right, that was uh, all for now and I can I hope you uh, enjoyed the session and if anyone has any questions, feel free to stick around and, and we'll be here for uh, a moment as well. So thank you so much. <laughs>